Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And tonight I'm uh, continuing in the study of uh, Christian creeds. Uh, we've talked about the uh, Apostles' Creed, the early uh, Nicene Creed, the revised Nicene Creed done in Constantinople in 381. Now, now tonight I'm going to discuss the uh, Chalcedonian Creed. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, though. I'm, my conclusion <laughs> from, from studying the Christian creeds, from studying all of early church history, all the church fathers, all of the theological discussions or arguments in the early church, all of the early church heresies, uh, my, my real major thing I've learned from this is that the it didn't take long at all after the apostles were deceased for the church to get all fouled up. And that's why I'm a biblicist. It's not Bible-olatry where I'm worshiping the Bible, but the Bible is what I'm trusting. I'm going to test everything by the Bible because so many of the th things that uh, I found from the writings, the, the arguments, when there was a dispute in the first few centuries throughout church history, they've, they've, uh, when there was a disagreement about theology, primarily about uh, who Jesus is, his deity, his humanity, uh, the relationship to the Father and the Holy Spirit. And um, the amazing thing is that um, all we really need to know, we find in the Bible. And that's why I'm, I'm very thankful. I, I told Brother Bill earlier today, I made a comment to him that, I am so thankful that we, the printing press was invented because when the printing press came, they were able to mass produce Bibles and they were able to get Bibles in everybody's hands. Anybody today who wants a Bible, you can have one. They're readily available. We can go right to the word of God, right to the scriptures ourselves, instead of relying on, uh, you know, uh, other theologians, either present day theologians or ancient theologians from history go right to the scriptures and you'll see the plain truth in front of your eyes. But um, uh, every time there was a council called, it was because there was a dispute. And you'd have all these different factions and different positions. And then the people's at either extreme, you know, they tried to find a consensus you know, somewhere in the middle and, the, and you're, you're at one extreme or the other, you know, that you had to either conform to the consensus uh, or you'd be uh, excommunicated and perhaps even exiled. Um, and then, but then they, they write a creed after the council was over. They, they write a creed expressing the conclusions of the council. And these are, the, all the conclusions are called canons. Now, many people think the canon is simply uh, the, 39 books in the Old Testament that are accepted as uh, the Word of God, and the 27 books in the New Testament that are accepted as the Word of God. So a total of 66 books that we call the, the canon of Scripture. Um, but the word canon is also used for every ruling of these councils. It's like the if we look at the United States, we have the Senate and the, and the Congress, and they present a bill, and then they vote on it. And if it's legislated and accepted, it's it's a, it becomes a bill. Well, that's the same thing where you could look at a canon. Some of these councils, they would end up writing maybe 10 or 20, 30 or 40 various canons where conclusions and positions that everybody was expected to conform to. Uh, so now let's look specifically at the Chalcedonian canon. A little bit of history on it. It says um, um, the, um, the Chalcedonian definition, also confession of or creed of Chalcedon, was adapted in AD 451. So we've moved along quite a bit now. The Nicene Creed was 325 AD. The Nicene Constantinople Creed was 381 AD. And now we have this Creed of Chalcedon in 451. Every time there's another council and they come up with another creed and new canons, uh, it's because after time has passed, they found that there's a new 
problem that they need to address. Uh, so it says 451 AD at the Council of Chalcedon in Asia Minor. That council was the fourth of the first seven ecumenical councils. Now, ecumenical council just means that before Council of Nicaea, which uh, Emperor Constantine called that council, uh, but before that one, there were other councils, but they were regional. Uh, and they, the ecumenical council just simply means that uh, it wasn't just uh, in the ch various church leaders of a particular region. It wasn't limited to them. Church leaders from all over the known world were asked to attend and participate. The first ecumenical council was uh, 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea. And then the second one was the Council in Constantinople in 381 AD. Uh, the, the council, and it says here that this is the, um, this is the, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what number it was. I think it was like, this is the, maybe the third. Uh, that was the, oh no, it was the fourth. It says that was the fourth of the first seven ecumenical councils, which are accepted by Chalcedonian churches. These are the Eastern Orthodox, the Catholic, and most Protestant churches. It is the first council not recognized by any of the Oriental Orthodox churches, uh, which may also be classified as non-Chalcedonian. Let me look up Oriental Orthodox and see who they are. Um, these are the, uh, the Coptic, the Ethiopian, the Eritrean, the Syriac, Armenian, Apostolic, uh, Malankara. Uh, so those are the people that were uh, not participating or not agreeing to this council and these canons, this creed. It says the definition defines that Christ is acknowledged in two natures, which, quote, come together into one person or one hypostasis. Uh, the, the formal definition of two natures in Christ was understood by the critics of the council at the time, and is understood by many historians and theologians today to side with Western and Antiochian Christology um, and to diverge from the teachings of Cyril of Alexandria. So you have varying opinions about how to explain the, the nature, the humanity particularly. The, the previous councils were really addressing the deity of Christ. That was what was in question. You had... Uh, Sibelius on one extreme saying that Jesus is God Almighty and he is the Father and he is the Son and he is the Holy Spirit. There's not three persons, but Jesus is the same. He is, that's called modalism. And so that that was argued against. And then the, the other far extreme, you had the uh, uh, Arians and they, they argued that Jesus was not God at all, e eternal. He was a creature. He was created by God. He was the first one created. And then after that, Jesus and God created everything else. So uh, you had one, one side saying Jesus is just a creature. The other side said he's not only uh, truly is God, but he is, is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the, they, and then they, they came up with the, these councils to address and define that. Uh, but now the question of what about his humanity? And this is what is going to be debated and, and uh, concluded here in this Chalcedonian uh, uh, council. Uh, let me see, Cyril of Alexandria, who always stressed that Christ is one. However, a modern analysis of the sources of the creed uh, uh, and a reading of the acts or proceedings of the council recently translated into English show that the bishops consider Cyril the great authority and that even the language of two natures derives from him. Well, see, so we have most people I talk to who, uh, who are Christians, who believe in biblical Christianity, studied the Bible, and maybe if we're, we've been experienced enough and we're familiar with the concept, the principle, the true doctrine that uh, Jesus Christ is truly 100% God 
and he's also truly 100% man. And so um, that's the conclusion that they come to in, or, or not that they come to, but they're, they are defining and declaring and asking people to, uh, or insisting that people conform to this and accept this doctrine. Uh, but this is the time when they started trying to define this and they came up with this term, two natures. Now, it says Oriental Orthodox descent. This is the reason the Oriental Orthodox churches uh, would, didn't participate and didn't agree to this, I guess. It says the Chalcedonian definition was written amid controversy between the Western and Eastern churches over the meaning of the incarnation. Uh, that's, incarnation is when the word became flesh. God became a man. Uh, the ecclesiastical influence of the emperor and the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so yeah, they are also the emperors after Constantine and the other emperors following him, they started playing a big part in the church. And that was, a, that was something that was discussed and uh, uh, argued over if the emperor should play any part in the church and the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Well, we know what happened uh, that um, the, the Bishop of Rome uh, was, was given ultimate power over all of the churches, all of the other bishops, and therefore that's how we end up with this idea of uh, having a, a dope. And now the current dope is Dope Francis. Uh, but the concept of dopes uh, uh, that rule over the entire church here is uh, the idea that the, the Bishop of Rome is, is becomes the leader of the whole church. And even if like the one we have, or the, I don't have them because he's not my my pope or dope. He's my dope, not my pope. But Dope Francis, uh, he's from South America. He was not the Bishop of Rome. But when he was crowned as the, the pope, then now he's also considered to be the Bishop of Rome. So that this idea that elevating the Bishop of Rome to, to such importance and uh, supreme power was discussed in this council too. It became standard Orthodox doctrine. However, the Coptic Church of Alexandria dissented holding to Cyril of Alexandria's preferred formula for the oneness of Christ's nature in the incarnation of God, the word as out of two natures. So Cyril's language is not consistent and he may have uh, countenanced the view that it is possible to contemplate in a theory two natures after the incarnation. But the Church of Alexandria thought that the definition should have stated that Christ be acknowledged out of two natures rather than in two natures. Uh, you see that the detail of these arguments, uh, not just here on the subject of Christ's humanity, they've established his deity. Now, what, let's, how, do you, how is he also fully human? Um, some people are arguing that uh, he couldn't be human because the flesh is, is evil. The material world is evil. Um, those were the, uh, uh, well, it was a Gnostic uh, teaching, but it was also before the, the, the Docetists. The Docetists became before the Gnostics, and they, they believed that the material world was evil, and therefore Jesus could not have a real material existence. He was, it was all spiritual, and, and God is a spirit. He's not physical. He couldn't be physical. That would make him evil. And therefore, Jesus as a human was only an illusion. And therefore, there was really no death or resurrection. <clears throat> so the idea of, of uh, the deity of Christ is established, but his humanity now is what is being discussed and argued over. Um, let me... Let me go back here to Kelsey. Um, okay, let's take a look at the creed itself now. I'll read the creed and just, you know, kind of analyze it uh, point by point. It says, this creed was adopted at the Fourth Ecumenical Council held at Chalcedon, located in what is now Turkey, in 451 as a response to certain heretical views concerning the nature of Christ. It established the orthodox view that Christ has two natures, human and divine, that are unified in one person. 
Now, here's the creed. We, th we then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable, rational soul and body, let me pause there for a minute first and just go back to a couple of points here. It says, we then following the Holy Fathers with all consent. Well, first of all, um, I personally resent that kind of terminology, Holy Fathers. Do you know the title they give Pope Francis today? Besides Pope, uh, it, it, his title is Holy Father. The, the term Holy Father appears only one time in the KJV. And that one time, it's a title for God Almighty. And yet, uh, Dope Francis and all the previous uh, dopes before him, uh, they have uh, taken the title of Holy Father. And now we see here, as I said, it didn't take long, right after the apostles had been deceased, beginning of the second century, the third century, I'm seeing all this Roman Catholic theology enter into the church. Even though they didn't have the term Roman Catholic at that time, they started using the word Catholic because Catholic was just simply meant universal. It was supposed to be synonymous with the body of Christ, which means uh, the t sum total of all true Christian believers. Uh, and yet, uh, so they started using this word Catholic, and then eventually now we think of uh, it being Roman Catholic. But I see Roman Catholic theology has entered in right away, right in the second and third centuries, uh, baptismal regeneration, the uh, elevating the, the significance of uh, the uh, c communion so that it basically became that you get saved when you get water baptized, your sins up to that point in your life are forgiven, but every sin after baptism, you've got to make penance for that. So you have to confess it, you're, you're told to make penance, and then after you make, if you make your penance completely, then you're clean again and you're saved until you sin more, and it's a constant cycle. And if you couldn't make enough penance, if you couldn't fulfill all the penance to to get all your sins forgiven again, then the remainder was was on you when you die so that you have to go to purgatory. And that's when the remainder of the sins that are on you that you did not do penance on, that's when you'd have to work that off somehow, have those sins purged from you in purgatory until you can go to heaven. And that is that kind of theology was entering into the church very early on. It didn't happen just, you know, last year or a hundred years or a thousand years. It, it happened early in the church, this kind of translation, emphasizing the uh, elevating Mary, uh, I, the, the using the sacrament of communion to saying that uh, when, when you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves you. And what you the only way you can get the Holy Spirit back and get saved again is through communion. That's why excommunication was such a horrible threat for those people who believe that. Because excommunicate, a lot of people think that means, well, you're kicked out. But excommunicate is based on the root word communion. And communion reference to the sacrament of, of the, the Lord's Supper. And since they believe that if you didn't get communion, you couldn't get the Holy Spirit back in you and you're lost, you're doomed. So this is, this is what I've seen through studying early church history and, and these councils and these creeds as uh, uh, the church has become as a whole. Now there are around the world, I'm sure there's a lot of real biblical Christians who didn't get uh, contaminated with these things, but uh, much of what we've, I've been discussing here as far as the ecumenical councils and all the bishops from all the churches that get together, they're already uh, spoiled. They've already spoiled this true uh, 
understanding of who Jesus is and, 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 and the means of salvation. Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifested in the flesh as the Son of God and our Savior, who died on the cross and paid for our sins and was raised from the dead and who gives us eternal life if we'll just put our faith completely in him. No religious works are required on our part. Water baptism is not required for salvation. Taking communion is not required to keep your salvation. This is, I'm telling you about the kind of Christianity we find in the Bible. And if all the people the first century or two had their own Bibles, they wouldn't have been able to get away with all this. So um, that's why I, I'm really objecting to this term when it says, it says uh, in the creed, it says, we then following the Holy Fathers, now, the Holy Fathers is a reference to what they, uh, a lot of people refer to as the, the church fathers. These are the people who followed the apostles, like Ignatius and Polycarp and, and so on. There's many of them, they knew the apostles. And, and then, so you have, you have the apostles, and then you have the next generation that knew them, and then another generation that knew them, and then another generation. And as you get farther and farther away from the apostles, and farther, farther away from what it says right here, that's where these problems enter. And now we've got a reference to them calling them holy fathers, which is heresy. We should call no man father, that Jesus said, and we especially call no man holy father. So I don't know if I'll even get through this whole thing at the rate I'm going because I'm getting so tired about this. But again, I'll begin from the beginning. We then, following the holy fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess and and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead, and also perfect in manhood. Okay, this part's it's all good. Truly God and truly man. Okay, I think we'll all agree with that. Of a reasonable, rational soul and body. Consubstantial. Uh, that consubstantial means the same substance. That's uh, the Greek word is homoousios, and, and, and that was word was. Uh, debated and finally agreed upon for the uh, uh, the Nicene Creed and the Constantinople Creed. Uh, but the idea that uh, Jesus and the Father are this actually same substance or essence. They're both truly 100% God. Um, so it says, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. In other words, his essence is the same as the Father's in his uh, divinity or his deity, but in his humanity, he's consubstantial with us, and he's the same substance as us. In other words, he didn't just put on a layer of skin on top of God, and he's just covered with human skin. No, he, he's completely the same substance, exactly like you and me. With He had, he had uh, not only skin, he had muscle tissue, he had skeletal tissue, he had organs, he had systems, he had all of the bodily functions and things that we, we have. He was completely human. And then his other nature was completely God, just equal, equal with, and consubstantial with the Father. In all things like unto us, so and he was like us in every way, but without sin. Now, obviously, that, I think, I think all of us biblical Christians agree with that. Uh, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead. Now, begotten before all ages, before uh, ages uh, of the Father according to the Godhead, there's a, another term that they have in the, um, the other creeds. They came up with this term. It says eternally begotten. In other words, because begotten, you have Arius, uh, taking the word begotten and, and and saying that begotten means that you had a beginning, that you were created. And and therefore, if Jesus is the uh, the begotten son of God, then he must have been created. And that was the Arian, the Arian uh, uh, you know, heresy that had to be corrected. Uh, so here it also says begotten before all ages. So a person could misunderstand this and think that, well, here you have God the Father who's eternal, 
and then he created Jesus, he begot him before time began. And then see, this is this is what the seventh day, I'm not seventh day Adventist, this is what the Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is God with a little G. You know, he's <laughs> he is created. He's the first thing that God created was was Jesus. And then after that, God used Jesus and they worked together, created everything else. So uh, this phraseology here could uh, be used just to, uh, you know, uh, by an Aryan, I think, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead. And in these latter days, for us and our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, now I believe in the virgin birth. I do not believe in the perpetual virginity of Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now, some Roman Catholics will try to get around that by saying, well, that was uh, her like uh, stepchildren because Joseph was married before. Mary had a previous marriage and had children, but Mary never had any children except Jesus, and she remained a perpetual virgin her whole life. Uh, but that's that's a Catholic, you know, fairy tale. Uh, she the the other brothers and sisters of Jesus were children of Mary and Joseph, and but here there you can see that they're beginning to. Um, uh, you now it says born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God. Now there was also a lot of debate about this term, the mother of God. <clears throat> now. Is she the mother of God? If you're the mother of God, you have to be before eter eternity. Uh, look who's here. Hey, brother. Evan? Hey, brother. Oh, I'm so glad you could join me. Have you listened at all yet? I'm sorry. Uh, well, have, you, I'm sorry. have you heard anything I've said so far? Yeah, well, yeah, I've been listening for a little bit. I was watching a movie online, and uh, I just thought I'd check what's going on on Google, and I saw you hang out and started listening. And uh, so I, I caught a few minutes of what you're saying. And I think it's very interesting. I would uh, mention also that when the uh, when when Christianity became the um, the uh, the legalized religion of of uh, the, the the Western world, uh, when uh, Emperor Theodosius uh, decreed that Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire, pagans by the Boodles flooded into the church in Rome. And the result was the formation of the Roman Catholic Church, which adopted all kinds of pagan religions, religious beliefs like purgatory, Hades, you know, a place that you, you could, you could, uh, an underworld, place of the underworld where somebody could earn their passage out, their freedom out of it, uh, back to the, to the world of the living. And so the Catholics, uh, and this is also seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh pays a ferryman. The Babylonian myth, where Gilgamesh pays a ferryman for a travel, uh, you know, entry into the across the river, which is the river Styx, according to the Romans Catholic Church, you know. So it's the same Babylon, uh, Babylonian and Greek uh, uh, pagan re religious ideas. This underworld. This is the purgatory of the Roman Catholics. You see, that's where they got it from the Babylonians. Who, uh, the Babylonians taught these ideas to the Greeks. And the Greeks gave it to the Romans, and the Romans adopted it in the Roman Catholic Church. It's just full of pagan ideas. Yeah, it's it's, it's all very very true, and I'm, I'm glad you uh, made the distinction uh, correctly that the emperor that made um, uh, Christianity, which I'm I'm going to say Christianity like this with quotes because it it wasn't truly christianity at this point as we know it as we see it in the bible it's already been very twisted by that point and then as you say of course they they even brought in a lot of a roman paganism that made it even worse but that was theodosius it was not constantine a lot of people think constantine made made uh christianity the religion of the mm -hmm. empire but what he did was he just simply said no more persecution it's a it's a legitimate it's illegal it's legal to be a christian yeah. But then Theodosius took a step further and said, not only is it legal, but it's the official. Everybody must be a Christian. Right. And that's when really everybody started introducing all the, the paganism, as you, just as you described, com completely correct. Uh, so let me ask you to respond to uh, my concern about what the term the mother of God in this creed. 
Oh, and we boy. see that in the previous creeds too, the term, the mother of God, elevating Mary in stature. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, the way I see this is that she is, she is the mother of uh, the humanity of Jesus. He, she, she gave birth to this human being, but she's not the mother of God. She could not possibly be the mother of God because mm -hmm. uh, God's eternal. She would have to be pre-eternal to be the mother of God. Yes, indeed. Now she's not, she, she said the biological mother, the mother of the flesh that was Jesus Christ, the, the humanity of him, the physical body. That's it. That's as far as it goes. That's for sure. The spirit was obviously God, uh, the spirit of God uh, in, the, in the flesh of man. Um, it, it, but uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's elevating Mary to a deity status. Uh, you know, it's no wonder that Roman Catholics kiss the toes of their statues of St. Peter and Paul and, uh, you know, uh, and, and John, and they got Mary, and they, they kiss their toes, and they, they revere these statues. And But if you ask a Catholic, uh, why do you worship statues? They say, well, we don't worship them. We just revere them. Well, what's, what's the difference? Well, there's no difference. Hmm. The idea of revering uh, is I've, that's one of my another one of my many pet peeves is because I, I, I see people that are they they accept the title of, of reverend and I think of I'll name a couple you got the rever Reverend L Sharpton the the Reverend Jesse Jackson uh, and I'll even add the the, the Reverend Billy Graham and uh, to me the word reverend comes from the root word to revere. And I'm not going to revere them and elevate them. They're equal to any other human being. They're not. We, they're, we're not to elevate people in terms of uh, saying their reverence. And that I also have this same argument against the um, separating the church from the from the laity and the clergy and having two classes. One class that lords it over the, the others. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Anything else before I, I continue reading here? Yeah, uh, I would like to mention uh, about that uh, Mary thing. Um, Jesus said, um, uh, let's see here. This is uh, Mark uh, 3. Uh, let's see, 30, uh, 31. Then uh, there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren seek, seek for thee. And he answered unto them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? So he said, and, and he looked around about them uh, and sat uh, about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God is the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. So I mean, if Mary is the mother of God, isn't Jesus refuting that right there? He's saying, She's not my mother, but anybody is my family if they're with God, right? So I just thought I'd point that out. But yes, please continue, brother. Yeah, I want to support your point there that uh, um, uh, Mary, uh, <clears throat> we, we learn from the scriptures that God chose her uh, for, for a, a reason. And, 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 and in that way, we can admire her and love her. Um, she, she is the mother of Jesus. Uh, but uh, Jesus clearly demonstrates in the verses you just read there that everybody should be considered to be equal. His mother, even his own mother, is not above any any other one that's come to him, any, anybody else. All right, let me read the, uh, continue reading here. It says, um, um, uh, the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, um, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and 
the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Uh, the last reference there is, is, and the creed of the Holy Fathers, uh, that's referencing probably the, uh, the, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed, or perhaps the, the, uh, the, the original Nicene Creed or the revised Nicene Creed in, in Constantinople. All of those creeds were addressing this question of the deity of Christ. So that's referencing that. But then again, it uses the term, the Holy Fathers. Did you hear what I said in the very beginning of this creed, my complaint about you using the term the Holy Fathers? Uh, no, I didn't hear that part, but that doesn't sound like a good thing to me. Yeah, yeah. Right. Jesus, uh, I'll repeat it very briefly then. The, 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 ter the term Holy Father appears only one time in the Bible, and it's a title for God himself, but the Roman Catholic papacy has usurped it and made it a title for their dopes, their yeah and uh, uh they're stealing uh, we're, jesus says don't call any man father and right. you especially don't call him holy father because that's the title for god right and jesus said to the pharisees uh they said is it is it uh, lawful for a man to uh you know to to perform miracles on the sabbath and, and i think is what he said and he said uh, no good master is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause and jesus said well, why callest thou me good there is none good say one that's God. So if, if God alone is truly good and God is only holy, what are we doing calling and what is anybody doing calling a man holy for crying out loud? Yeah. <laughs> oh, forgot and I was talking without uh, muting there for a second. Uh, all right. So here's the thing that's going on with these creeds and what they call church fathers. Um, if you and I never heard about uh, the church fathers, the church councils, and the creeds, all we did was read the Bible together, the two of us, and then and we read in the Bible that um, there's one God, and and Jesus is God, and the, the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But there's one God. Mm. Um, you and I would, first of all, we will accept it because it's the word of God. But then the problem is, well, how do you explain that? Mm. Well, th these church fathers, the first few centuries, their time was con just about completely consumed with, with writing and, and trying to philosophize and find ways of explaining it. Now, if you and I were talking about it, we'd probably, in our own ways, just t try to explain it too. And there's, there's nothing wrong with explaining it. But the church fathers and the generations of church fathers following them, they're men. They're, and, and, and many people are accepting their conclusions uh, that they and they wrote in all their books of theology and their conclusions uh, from these councils and their creeds. They're just accepting them that like this, that's like the word of God. Yeah. And, and I say, no, uh, they're only men like Brother Evan and Brother Luke. Uh, we study the scriptures and we can we can try to explain this Godhead in our own words, just as they explained it in their own words and they came up with their terminology but guess what if we have this and we have the holy spirit i think that we we're going to be fine without relying on the church fathers and their creeds even though in this creed uh much of what they say i think you and i are probably in much agreement with much of it and yet there's some things like the term the holy father and the mother of god and in other creeds, it talks about uh, when it addresses uh, 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 salvation, which they don't really address in any creeds regarding salvation and, until the Council of Trent. I'll get to that later. But uh, when they reference it, not, when they, they don't try to define and explain it in any creeds, but when they reference it, guess what? It, it's always related to one of two things, being baptized and you're saved, or being um, good, you go to heaven because you're good. Mm. The good ones go to heaven, <laughs> the evil ones go to hell. Do your penance. Yeah, so uh, I'm just saying that uh, I'm going to continue 
relying on the Bible, the more that I learn about early church histories and the church fathers and all those theologians, some of them were great thinkers, they're great uh, Christians, and, and some of them were, I, I wouldn't have, want to have anything to do with them because of the heresies that I see that entered into the early church. And, and so I, I would hope that maybe we can learn about the problems that happened and the state that we see things in today, it didn't happen like that. You know, it was gradually over centuries, mm -hmm. these things uh, creeped in. <clears throat> but I'm thankful we have the Bible and we, we each of us have our own Bible. We can go directly to it and, and, and see for ourselves the truth. Amen. What's your response to that? Yeah, man, ex exactly. The word of God is the highest authority. It is the final authority on all matters of doctrine. Scripture tells us so. Wasn't it Paul who wrote? That scripture is uh, is uh, is uh, all scripture is for I can't remember the words uh, for for teaching and learning uh, and and it is the authority and you're right the the philosophies of men the Bible even gives us that warning you know beware of vain uh, vain philosophies of men you know and so these ideas of men another one that, that crept in was this uh, calvinism idea that they got from the greeks this idea that uh, all things are determined by god every single movement of every molecule and everyone's salvation has already been predetermined before he made the world because of the way they interpret passages relating to uh, the words predestination and whatnot they, the, the calvinists got got that idea from ignatius uh, well, not ignatius but uh, augusta and uh, he got it from uh, from Roman Catholicism, who got it from the Greeks, the Greek mythology. It's not in the Bible, the idea that people were saved already before he made the world. Those passages that Paul wrote in Romans are, are referring to Israel, not not to salvation. So uh, 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 of the individual you know, that God chose, he would have a people unto himself. So Calvinism is another one of those her uh, heresies that crept in to the church in the early centuries after Christ, the ideas that became later known as Calvinism. So, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I would just point out also, brother, that, uh, you know, that the curtain ramped when when Christ passed on the, on the cross. Uh, from top to bottom, God split that, 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 that curtain all the way down. And uh, this was God's way of saying, now you have access directly to the throne of God yourself. You don't need to go through the priest. Uh, you know you don't need to go through the the the, the chief priest you don't have to go uh, who goes into the inner sanctum by himself now you have direct access the, as the word says to the throne of god because of christ we can talk directly to the father and we can make our appeals and prayers to him we can we can we can speak to him and thank him for his blessings we have direct access to the throne of god and uh, God split that curtain all the way down as, as a symbol that now because of Christ, every individual can go directly to God in prayer and God will will, will have a relationship directly with them. And uh, uh, so we don't need these Catholic priests. We don't need to say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned and then him say as if he's got the authority of God to absolve you, say, you're, you know, for, forgiven. We, we go directly to God now through Jesus Christ. Um, I've made a, a couple of videos uh, when uh, Dope Francis was on his American tour uh, and uh, the, the country was going crazy and idolizing him and worshiping him. I did make a couple of short videos uh, complaining about some of the things he was had recently said. And one of the things that he just said last year, he said, don't don't have try to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's a very dangerous thing. What in the world? <laughs> oh my goodness! And it's because that's been the, that's been the teacher uh, the teaching of uh, Roman Catholicism all along is that you cannot have a direct relationship with Jesus. You've got to go through the church, and they're an intermediate yeah. intermediary for us. But as you said, the curtain was torn open and uh, showing us. That every single person, uh, it doesn't matter what your, uh, you know, your your gender, your race, your uh, anything, uh, every single person without exception, you can you can go directly to God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, and and have a personal relationship with Him. You, there's no need for you to go through priests. In fact, the Bible says that every person that's put their faith in Jesus as their Savior 
is all, uh, one of the titles for us is saint. Another title for us is priest. We are all priests. Uh, according to the Bible, uh, we don't need uh, someone in a clergy position saying he's a priest and you're not. And then he has some kind of uh, hierarchy uh uh, legal authority over, over you and you must go through him. You can't even read your own Bible. Uh, they, they didn't even allow Bibles and they burned them throughout mm -hmm. history. They didn't want anybody to go directly to the Bible they, because they didn't trust the people. Uh, they th they realized that if they saw, read the scriptures for themselves, they would clearly see the heresies being taught by Roman Catholicism and they'd rebel. And that's finally what happened in the Reformation. Yes, it is. In fact, uh, if you were caught with a Bible in your hands, uh, the sentence was death. They'd bring you, to, uh, bring you at the stake, or behead you. Something that you you would die. You would pay for having the Word of God in your possession, and uh, that's just uh, that's absolutely terrible. Like you said, they wanted to maintain their control and their, over the people because they were getting rich off the people, selling penances, and all these other pagan uh, garbage. You know, that would, like you said, that would come tumbling down if the Bible got in the hands of the common man and woman and that you know, throughout the Middle Ages. Well, that would have been the end of the Catholic Church. Back then it would have. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way for it today. But it sure would have caused a, a heck of a stir back then. So they knew better than to let the population get their hands on the Word of God. They had to keep it out of their hands. So they'd kill you if they kept you with it. Well... Uh, I, so far, I've done a study on the Apostles' Creed, the uh, Nicene Creed of 325 A.D., the Revised Nicene Creed in Constantinople in 381, and these uh, these Nicene Creeds were uh, defining the the deity of Christ and answering the heresies of Arianism and Sabellianism. And so that was the purpose of that. And I can understand the purpose and, and, and that, what they tried to accomplish. And not everything in these creeds makes me sick. Like, but there are some things I'm seeing in these creeds that really, really uh, angers me because I can see right from the beginning in the creeds, heresies have crept in. Uh, but the thing that stood out to me, uh, and, and even in this creed here, there is no reference to uh, how do you get saved? Uh, the only thing they're addressing, which is of equal importance to me, that there's two things that are essentially important for, for all of us uh, Christians. And that is, we, we must understand who Jesus is. And he truly is eternal God Almighty. He's not a created being. Uh, and he truly is a man. He is man and God, and yet, See, that's another argument that instead of the three persons, they're saying, well, if you believe he's God and man, you've got four persons. You got Jesus, the man, Jesus, the God, the Holy Spirit and the Father. Now you've got four. So <laughs> they, all these all these ideas were entering in and being debated and argued over. So I can understand people wanting to get together, discuss it and iron it all out. Um, but I can also see that a lot of heresies creeped in. But what, what really aggravates me is they did address the deity of Christ, but they failed in addressing how do you get saved? And the reason they did that is because there was no disagreement over it. Pretty much they were all agreed that it was based upon uh, water baptism, the sacraments, and penance. And that, that's why they pretty much all these bishops, all these councils, they all agreed on that, even early in the church. There was no debate over it or argument over it. The people who disagreed with it, they were off on other factions that, that were called heretics and they were being killed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the Bible teaches what the God, Word of God says that, uh, you know, we can't do a thing to make ourselves clean before God. He had to do it for us. You know, that, that's a complete contrast to, to what the to those teachings, those heretical teachings, you know. But, you know, look, this that's that's something that separates Christianity from all the religions of the world, all these re false religions of the world are self-help systems where, you know, God puts you on a scale at the end of your life and says, did you do, do more good than bad uh, than you're in, you know. And, and that that's just not how it works. Uh, the, Bible, the Word of God teaches that we can do nothing to make ourselves worthy. It, it was all been done by Christ, and we put our faith in him for what he's done, and we get saved that way. Then the atonement of his sacrifice uh, pays for our sin, and we, we're forgiven. So, 
that's a very different system, isn't it? Christianity from these pagan ideas. And this separates Christianity from all the religions of the world and proves all of them false. Here's another thing I think uh, is, is interesting about that. If, if these religions were right and there were some kind of system like that of, you know, self-improvement, self, uh, you know, and holy self-holiness, really that's very blasphemous because it, it, it's really arguing that a human being has the ability to, to to earn the you know the right to be in the presence of God. He can stand there with his hands on his hips before God Himself and say, "Hey, I made it. You let me in because I'm good. I'm like like you." Oh my goodness, that is that's blasphemous right there. I mean, that's terrible. Christianity, of course, the Word of God, as you know, teaches uh, something very different from that. Very contrast uh, contrasting to all these false religions around the world. We can't do it for ourselves. We, he had to do it for us. Yeah, and I would I would add uh, add to that point that the um, the people who think that salvation comes through personal merit, through your, your own efforts, through your religious works, uh, what they're really doing is they're 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 believing that they, they can go before God at the judgment and say Look at all the things I did. I did this and this and this and this. Uh, I deserve heaven. You're in my debt. Pay me my uh, wages I've earned. You owe me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, if, if you're watching this now and you want to go to, before God and plead your case and say how good you were, you're going to find out that the Bible says that uh, 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 there's a standard we've got to meet. It's called... Um, the, the glory of God. The glory of God is perfection. Jesus said, go and be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. So you're striving, you're becoming religious, you're following all these religious rules and regulations, and you're trying to do good and stuff, and you're, you're following short. You'll always fall short because you cannot be perfect. And if, if you were to try to be perfect right now for the rest of your life, guess what? It's already too late because you've already failed. You've already sinned. You cannot erase that from your record. So you will never reach this glory of God standard. And that's why hopefully you'll understand that you need to just fall on your face and say, have, have, God have mercy on me, a sinner, the way that the uh, tax collector, the publican did. Uh, mm -hmm. The Jesus told this story about this person that was trying to, uh, you know, proclaim his own righteousness. He was a Pharisee and he was, he prayed, he said, uh, boy, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like these other men. You know, I tithe and I fast and I do my alms and you know, and uh, and then uh, the 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 man next to him was a tax collector, and they, they're considered to be like the lowest because they're they're thieves, they're they're dishonest, they're scandalous. How, how they cheat their own their own people and they're traitors, and they're really looked down upon. But this publican, he didn't try to tell God the things he did and why he why he should go to heaven. He just fell on his face and said, God, have mercy on, on me, a sinner. And that's the position that we should all, uh, that's the conclusion that we should all come to, is that don't try to plead to God that you've done good works and you deserve heaven. Plead to God, uh, I am I failed, and thank you for the mercy and grace that I get through my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's exactly right. Well, um, so I've, we've talked about the Apostles' Creed in the past and the Nicene Creed, the Cap Constantinople Creed, and now this Chalcedonian Creed. And I've got a few other creeds left. There's many. There, I, I found that there's probably a hundred creeds if we want to look at all of them. But I'm trying to look at the, the, the biggest, most popular ones that are most, most generic or broadly used. Um, but so next, uh, I'll look at the Athanasian Creed. Uh, and then after that, um, I thought about going to the uh, Westminster's Confession at the Reformation. But I, as I read the Westminster's Confession, it just makes me want to vomit. And it, it is, it's just Calvin could have written it. It's just they could have taken it right out of the, the writings of Calvin. So uh, if you haven't seen my and if you don't know my problem with Calvinism, go to my playlist, Calvinism Debunked, and you'll understand why it is, is one of the most evil philosophies ever invented. Uh, so I'm not going to read the Westminster Creed, but I, I am going to go uh, tell you that 
after they made the Westminster's Creed and, and after the Reformation and the in the Reformation, what they basically did was they they rebelled or left Roman Catholicism because of the works based system for salvation. And they left it because they read the Bible and said, it's not by works, it's by faith, by grace and faith. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when that happened, as a response, the Roman Catholic Church did what they call the Counter-Reformation. It's called the Council of Trent. And in the Council of Trent, they finally get around, after all these centuries, they get around to uh, es establishing their formula for salvation. Uh, and it's, uh, it's completely works-based. So we'll, that's where we'll be going with this. Uh, but for, for now, we'll finish with the Chalcedonian Creed, and that's where we'll be looking at the few more creeds before where this whole subject is, is concluded. So, brother, uh, let me not uh, fail to say if anybody's watching right now, uh, I would hope that you will uh, ask for you to, to, to pray for uh, Brother Evan's wife and, and her health. Uh, she, she's going through something very, very difficult right now, and uh, I, I'm praying for, for her. Uh, what is your wife's name, Evan? Sharon. Sharon. Mm -hmm. Sharon. So please, everybody, play, pray for uh, Sharon's health and a full recovery. Okay? Thank you. All right, brother. Uh, uh, I think we talked about salvation. Usually I end every show talking about that. I think we've pretty much kind of just eased into it without even any thought. It just It's really what comes naturally to us because no matter what you talk about in the Bible, it doesn't matter if it's... Uh, you know, a creation or end times uh, uh, or any other theological question, eventually it makes a full circle. It comes back to Jesus and salvation. Right. Uh, so uh, I hope you understand if you're watching this video that it's impossible to get to heaven through your own efforts, that you'll just surrender and give up and say it's hopeless and I'm going to trust Jesus instead. Why should you trust him? Because he's God. He became a man so that he could die for your sins. He did pay for all our sins. He was buried. And on the third day, he was raised to life, a bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. And this bodily resurrection was predicted. Jesus said on numerous times, uh, if, if you just destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And he was referencing his body, bodily resurrection. And he said this would be the sign to prove his claims were true. His claim that he's God, he's Savior, he has power over life and death. And he promises that if you'll trust him, instead of trying to get to heaven some other way, just rely on him completely. It's like this icon here I've got. Uh, let me see. This is this is a good illustration here. Jesus wants to take you to heaven. He, and he's, he's offering you heaven. Eternal life in heaven is a free gift. And, and he says, I'll take you up there and, and just trust me. And if you'll trust him, he promises you, you're going to go to heaven. It, since it's a promise from God, it's actually a guarantee. And that's why I can say with confidence that, uh, Brother Evan, uh, you're guaranteed. There is no doubt. It's absolutely certain you're going to go to heaven. Glorious. Yeah. And it's not because of works of righteousness, which you have done, but it's according to his mercy and his grace and his free gift of salvation through, through faith in Jesus Christ. Man, he kept the law because I couldn't do it. He kept the law of God perfectly. He never sinned once his whole life because he was God in the flesh. I can't do that. I've never, I haven't done it. So uh, I, I'm guilty. And, uh, you know, standing before God without Christ, the sentence is death. You know, you, you, the standard is, as you pointed out, is God's perfection. But because Jesus Christ kept the law in my place, because he was sinless, uh, I'm I'm set free from the law of sin and death. And and, and that's the, the glory of God, the great love of God, that he was willing to do this for us. And, and let me just, um, if I might point out one thing, that a lot of people who don't really understand Christianity or are new to it, and they're looking into it, and they're you know curious about it. Uh, don't they have a problem? I think some of them understanding. Well, why did Jesus have to die? Well, on this on the cross, and why did God do it this way? Why 
why did why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Why couldn't have God save just some other way? Well, let me explain that briefly. Uh, the wages of sin, the wages of sin, is death, according to the Scripture. So somebody has to pay the price, because the standard is God. Now, uh, God has said in His Word in Deuteronomy, in Revelation, in Psalms, and Ezekiel, and other places, that He will not punish one for the sin of another. See, I'm not guilty of your sins, and you're not guilty of mine. So I'm guilty of my own sins. Somebody else is guilty of their own other their, their sins. So now, if if um, the way that God chose to fix this problem for us, the sin problem, is that He took on flesh and died in our place, and He did it this way. I think at, at least partly because, see, it, because God has said He wouldn't punish one for the sin of another. That would be unjust. Imagine, in a human courtroom. A man goes before a judge, and the judge says, "Okay, you're guilty. You robbed the convenience store. The evidence is all in, in, in you know, against you." Um, but here's what I'm going to do: I'm going to get that guy off the third row over there, and I'm going to make him go to prison instead. You go free. Would that be just? Absolutely not. You can't punish one guy for the crimes of another. God wouldn't do it either. He said in His Word at least four or five times, He won't do that. Uh, each according to their works. So, uh, so since. God couldn't punish an angel or a human in your place because that would be immoral for God to punish one person or one being for, for uh, uh, the sin of another. This is why God took on flesh in himself and died in our place to make it to, so that this way he could have his justice without punishing anyone for anybody else's wrongdoing. And this means Jesus Christ has to be God. As the Bible t tells us, he couldn't be an angel. He couldn't be a mortal human being. He has to be God. Christianity hinges in, on and requires that to be true, else it does not work. Because God himself had to do it, take our sin upon himself and, and pay the price. for it. Otherwise, he would have been punishing one for the sin of another, and that would break his law and his character. And that's why he did it in our place and thank god that he did yeah amen all true uh, and if if one person was uh, said i volunteer to pay for if i volunteered to pay for your sins well wait a second i can't pay for your sins because i've got my own sins to pay for yeah <laughs> you need a sinless substitute right and so J jesus lived a perfect sinless life as i said the bible says that we all fall short of the glory of god well the glory of god is perfection and jesus is the only one that lived a perfect sinless life so jesus set the standard he is the glory and we all fall short of that so his sinless perfect righteous life the the great thing about this is that there's a transaction when i put my faith in jesus uh all, all my sins are charged against him. He paid for my sins and all of his good works and his righteousness and perfection is credited to me. That's, that's the transaction that takes place uh, because of our faith in Jesus. Amen. So he, says he, well, became, he became sin for, uh, in, in our place. That's exactly right, brother. So uh, please, if you're watching this, uh, basically what I want you to know is that uh, uh, we, we we've been using this word Christianity but let me let me emphasize it this way I, I call it Christianity uh, a Christian is, is a person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation uh, they're, they're trusting him completely they're depending on him they're relying on him they're not considering that their own efforts, their own uh, righteousness, their own merit factors in it all. They just dis dismiss that and consider that as what the scripture says, filthy rags before God. So we're, we're just saying, just put your faith in Jesus, trust him completely. We're not asking you or requiring you to join a religion, become a religious person, follow a set of religious rules. We're simply asking you to trust this person who is Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. Uh, okay, brother, I'll give you the last word on this, and then we'll live in the live. But I, I have something I want to say after we uh, we're finished here. If you can hang on, okay? 
Sure. Um, well, I, I don't know that I could uh, really add much to that. I think you've covered it, uh, salvation, exactly right. Uh, you've told us uh, how it works and how the way God has explained what he's done for us. And he's, he's done it because he's, a, he, he's good and he's full of love. And, and, and as the scriptures teach, he's, he's full of love. He teaches us to be like him, char have charity, to have love, to, be, to forgive others because he forgives our sins. And uh, so, amen to everything you said, brother. All right, I'm glad you could join me tonight. I hope you're available. You know, join me whenever possible. And uh, to any viewers, please uh, join join me nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.